In this video, we're going to try to provide a course recap of both confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. My going gut feeling is at this point, you're going to start feeling overwhelmed with the material in this course because we built from sampling distributions its own kind of abstract idea. Central limit theorem, certainly an abstract idea built on top of the abstract idea behind sampling distributions. And then we've started using those abstract ideas fairly quickly in what I think you all are going to feel is a lot of R code. Now, I don't know if any of this is true. It's just my going assumption from previous semesters uh, and students' responses at this point. Nobody's really commented on Piazza or anything, but please do if you feel the need to. Nonetheless, this video is going to try to summarize basically all the major concepts we've uh, covered in this class thus far. And I'm going to try to do it in a relatively short video. I think I'm going to emphasize how similar the techniques are that I've introduced to us. Even if they seem vastly different and kind of spread apart, really they come down to the same basic steps you just kind of have to manipulate those steps different ways. So I'm going to recall sampling distributions and the central limit theorem as I take you through uh, shorter explanations of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. These shorter explanations are necessarily going to leave something out. That's why they'll be shorter. But hopefully when you're looking for one video that provides the mechanics behind what you're doing, you can come back to this one. And when you need more in-depth detail about the, let's say, philosophy behind these procedures, then you can go back to the earlier videos. And I'll wrap up with some examples in R. I'm going to make up some examples in R so that I don't continue to steal uh, variables from your all's reports or your course notes. Because remember, in your reports, I want you to use variables I have not previously used in my videos. So for this video, I'll make up some data so that you all uh, don't have to limit yourself from the variables I use in this one. OK, so I'm going to jump into confidence intervals, and I'm going to do this recall sampling distributions and recall central limit theorem as I build up to confidence intervals on its own page. So here we go. In the world of statistics, we have a population. And we are starting to learn that the population has a distribution. And maybe the distribution of the population is right skewed. We are interested in estimating the population mean mu. We don't know what it is. So we take a random sample from the population. And from that sample, we calculate an estimate of the population mean. Now, the going idea behind a sampling distribution is that you took your own random sample, but theoretically, many other people could have taken a random sample themselves. And if we made a density plot of the theoretically possibly collected sample means, so you have one density plot of multiple sample means, each one of which was their own random sample, then by the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution of the sample mean, that is this density plot of multiple sample means, is approximately normal. So let's use that to discuss confidence intervals. And we'll start with a single proportion, P. So when we're talking about confidence intervals, what we're really doing is turning back to the approximately normal sampling distribution of this estimated proportion. And what we're trying to do is provide a net, a range of values between the lower bound and upper bound 
that captures with some probability that you specify, often 95%, the true population parameter. So we're trying to build this range of values that acts as a net to estimate the population proportion P. And the way we create this range of values is we start with P hat and we add some amount to get to this upper bound. And we take our sample estimate P hat and we subtract that same amount from P hat so that we get this range of values. The formula for a confidence interval for a single proportion goes like this. You start with your best guess of the population proportion, p hat, and then you add and subtract some number of standard errors. Now, I think the overall math for this formula is not that bad, so really the most difficult part is coming up with the value z star. And I'm going to draw up fake R code because that's where we're going to calculate Z star. And I think this is the hardest part of the overall formula. So we're just going to rehearse this here. So in the case of a confidence interval, you know the percentage you're interested in. This 95% is a known quantity. You want to use that known percent to find quantiles. Because you want to find quantiles, you'll use a function that starts with the letter Q. And for a single proportion, since the sampling distribution is approximately normal, we will use Q norm. Now I'm just going to steal the numbers from another video appropriate for a 95% confidence interval. So if you need to refresh on where those numbers come from, please go see the video appropriate for confidence intervals. And this is the basic calculation you'll need in R to come up with that value Z star. And then the rest of this just kind of falls into place. Now, the overall point I want to make is that when we're doing the same sort of confidence interval for a single mean mu, which is not a proportion, much of this stays the same. Really, most of it stays the same. There's only one slight difference in the sampling distribution. So let's just jump into this whole discussion again. By the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution of a single mean thought of as a random variable is approximately normal. But for a mean, you simultaneously have to estimate one extra parameter. And the added uncertainty of estimating an extra parameter gives us fatter tails in the sampling distribution. Those fatter tails are appropriately described by a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So as long as we recognize we have a t distribution here, then the majority of our calculations will be very similar as such. Our goal is to find a lower bound and an upper bound between which there is whatever percent confidence we want. And we generally pick 0.95 for a 95% confidence interval. Now, the way we use that 95% is to say we start with our best guess, mu hat, for the population mean of interest. And then we add some amount, which depends on that 95% to mu hat to get our upper bound, and we subtract some amount that depends on that 95% to get our lower bound. Now, in fact, the formula for a confidence interval for a single mean looks very similar to the formula for the confidence interval for a proportion. And in fact, other than T star being calculated differently than Z star, the math for the formula will stay largely the same. So really, what we need to practice then is figuring out where t star comes from. And the same logic holds. We know we want a 95% confidence interval. Because we know that percentage, we then want to work our way towards a quantile. As such, we're going to use a function that starts with q. 
and this sampling distribution follows the t distribution, so we're going to use the function qt. The first arguments to qt are exactly the same as that for q norm. You just got to remember that the t distribution takes degrees of freedom, and in the case of a single mean, there are n minus 1 degrees of freedom. It's going to be helpful. I'm going to start basically this whole presentation again, recalling sampling distribution and central limit theorem. But this time, instead of talking about confidence intervals, we'll talk about hypothesis tests. So we can do this a little bit quicker. This is our second time through. In the world of statistics, there is this population that we are interested in. The population has some numerical variable with maybe a left skewed distribution. That's totally fine. We're interested in making statements about, let's say, the population parameter mu. In order to learn about that population parameter, we take a random sample. And from our collected data, we calculate mu hat. Now, the going theory says that if a number of you and your friends each took your own random sample, and from each of your unique random samples, you each calculated your own estimate of the population mean. The collection of sample means would have a density plot that looks approximately normal. That's due to the central limit theorem that says the sampling distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. We use this fact, we implicitly use the central limit theorem when we do hypothesis tests for either a single proportion or a single mean. We will just start with a single proportion, p. Hypothesis tests have two components. They have a null hypothesis that makes a statement about the population parameter of interest. And as far as this class is concerned, we're always going to have equals in the null hypothesis. And then you just pick some value that's relevant to the particular context of your data set. The alternative hypothesis makes a statement about the same population parameter and the same value as in the null hypothesis. The only thing that changes is the symbol relating the two, the parameter to the value. In this video, I'm going to stick with not equals to. It's proper scientific practice to state your level of significance alongside your hypotheses before you collect any data or do anything. Once you have your hypotheses and your level of significance stated, you go about taking your random sample, collecting your data, and calculating your statistic of interest. In this case, we calculate a mean, p hat, and because of the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution for p hat would be approximately normal. Now, because we're on the normal distribution, we, I, honestly can't tell you why, use the letter z for our test statistic. And the formula for the test statistic goes like this. Start with your best guess for the population parameter of interest, subtract off the value in the null hypothesis, and divide by the standard error. Now, it doesn't matter if you get a positive value for z or a negative value for z. Because the alternative hypothesis is not equals to, you're going to be interested in calculating area relative to z in both tails. Now, there's a trick to do this, specifically for the case when the alternative hypothesis is not equals to. It's helpful to just immediately assert that you are in the right tail. Once you know you're in the right tail by taking the absolute value of z, we want to get all the area to the right. Area under a 
curve is probability in the world of statistics. We are looking for a p-value. You can use the p of p-value and probability, the fact that they both start with p, to remind yourself that when looking for a p-value, we will use a function that starts with the letter p. Now this sampling distribution for a single proportion is approximately normal, so we're going to use the function p norm. The only problem with p norm is that it actually calculates area to the left, just like our functions that start with the letter q. It's consistent, but it's not what we want in this exact scenario. So the way we can get the area in this right tail is by going 1 minus p norm. And actually, I'm going to erase this just really quick so I can scoot it all over just a touch. But I'll write it right back. There you go. It's good as new. So we now have a formula for the area in the right tail, but that's only half the area we want. Because the normal distribution is perfectly symmetric, in order to pick up this left tail, all we have to do is multiply that entire quantity by 2. And this is our p-value for a single proportion whose alternative hypothesis is not equals 2. This is the area in both tails. Now I'm going to try to make the same point about hypothesis testing that I did for confidence intervals. If we're looking at single proportions or single means, mu, most of the setup and the framework is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the shape of the sampling distribution. But the way I've set up this class is much of the rest of the framework remains the same. So let's just go through it all and make sure that it looks nearly identical. Hypothesis testing has two components. There is a null hypothesis that makes a statement about the population parameter of interest. As far as this class is concerned, we're always going to have equals in the null hypothesis. And then you specify some value that's specific to the context of interest. There's an alternative hypothesis that makes a statement about the same parameter as the null hypothesis and uses the same value as the null hypothesis. The only thing that's different is the symbol to rate, relate the population parameter to that value. In this case, I'm going to pick not equals to. It's proper scientific practice to choose your level of significance when you set your hypotheses before you look at any data. Once you have your hypotheses and your level of significance set, you are interested in making statements about the population mean mu. You'll do so by taking your random sample, calculating a mean of your data, and then implicitly applying the central limit theorem, which states that the sampling distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. But when it comes to a single mean, which is not a proportion, we simultaneously have to estimate a population standard deviation, which adds extra uncertainty to our sampling distribution. Because we have to simultaneously estimate a mean, the thing we're interested in, and a standard deviation, which we need to make statements about the um, sample mean, we have two population parameters we need to estimate. That added uncertainty by having to estimate the second parameter creates fatter tails in the sampling distribution. The fatter tails are accounted for by a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Once we recognize we're on a t distribution for the sampling distribution of a single mean, which is not a proportion, then we can go about calculating our test statistic, which is largely the same as before for a single proportion. Start with your best guess, mu hat, subtract off the value in the null hypothesis, 
and divide by the standard error. Now, what I want to remind you is whether you have a hypothesis test for a single proportion, so your data are zeros and ones, or you have numerical data that are not zeros and ones, you can calculate mu hat and p hat with the same function in R. You just use the function mean, and it'll get you out either one of those, depending on what type of data you have. So really, these formulas, although they use one different, two different symbols, z or t, p or mu, they're really the same code in R. And the idea follows just the same. You get this test statistic, t, whether it's positive or negative, because the alternative hypothesis is not equals to, you are interested in area under the curve in both tails. The natural way, a natural way, to calculate area under both tails is to start with the absolute value of t. That asserts you into the right tail. Now, we want a p value. P starts with p value starts with the letter p, and so does the function you're going to use in R. We're going to use a function p, and we're on the t distribution. So we'll use the function pt, which, because it's a t distribution, takes as a second argument the degrees of freedom in this scenario. Now, functions that start with the letter p in R are just like functions that start with the letter q in that they find or deal with area to the left. But we want area to the right of the positive value of t, so we will take 1 minus pt. And in fact, that only gets us half the area we want. We also want this other area in the left tail. So we will go two times that entire quantity. And this is nearly identical code for the p-value for a single proportion. The only difference really comes down to whether you're using the t-distribution or the normal distribution. At this point in the video, we've recalled sampling distributions and the central limit theorem twice now. We did it once for confidence intervals and once for, for hypothesis tests. I still feel obligated to show you sample R code to remind you how similar confidence intervals and hypothesis tests really are. I've tried to organize this course so that you don't have too much code thrown at you at one time. I know you probably feel like it's been too much code, but I'll be honest, I have worked hard to minimize it. And I'm going to really try to show you how much I've uh, really try to emphasize in the rest of this video how much I've tried to minimize that R code. So we're going to do examples in R. And I'm going to make up the examples. Your course reports are coming up. And I don't want you to use variables that I have previously used in my videos. In order to leave you more opportunity to find new variables for your reports, I'm going to make up data in this example. So I'm going to claim that we have a sample size of 301. And I'm going to start with, I'm going to say, a single mean. Now, what's different than how I wrote uh, my notes on the whiteboard, if you will, is first on the whiteboard I did confidence intervals for both means and proportions, and then I did hypothesis tests for means and proportions. In R, I think it's going to be a little bit cleaner if I start with a single mean and do confidence intervals and then hypothesis tests. Then I will change my variable to um, zeros and ones appropriate for a proportion. And then I'll do confidence intervals and hypothesis tests again. So here we go. Let's generate some fake binomial data with a sample size of n, number of trials within each observation to be 5. And I'm going to pick a population probability that you probably don't know off the top of your head, pi over 4. Now, you could certainly evaluate that code and figure out what it is. But I'm going to try to use the fact that you don't know pi over 4 immediately to remind you of some inherent facts about confidence intervals as we go. So let's generate some data. 
and then we'll do all the code we need for a confidence interval. So for a confidence interval, we need to estimate the population mean. We'll use the function mean to do that. We need to estimate the population standard deviation. We'll use the function SD for that. And we need to calculate the standard error, which just goes the population standard, the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now, those are, let's see, one, two, two thirds of the formula we need for a confidence interval. What we really need next is the value T star to tell us how many standard errors we will move above and below our best guess mu hat in order to form this range of values. And for confidence intervals, we will use the function name that starts with the letter Q. And because we're on the T distribution for a single mean, the function will be QT. Now again, these are the appropriate values for a confidence interval for 95%, but I'm gonna let you go search the other videos to remind yourself why those are the appropriate numbers. Don't forget your degrees of freedom. And we now have all the components we need for a confidence interval of 95%. You start with your best guess, you add and subtract, which we can just do by adding T star times the standard errors. And here is our 95% confidence interval for, and in this case, because I made up the data, I can tell you what the true population mean is. The true population mean is the value 3.93. And indeed, this confidence interval captures the true population mean, which means if we were to regenerate this data, from the same population and create a new confidence interval and regenerate the data, that is resample as if your friend took their own new sample and calculate a third confidence interval and regenerate the data and calculate a fourth confidence interval and repeat the process, let's say 10,000 times. This confidence interval is amongst the 95% of those 10,000 confidence intervals that include the true population mean. Though we know that 95% literally translates to, there are 5% of those 10,000 intervals that will not capture this true population mean. See how I just took that opportunity to remind you of the technical definition of the percent confidence in a confidence interval? Nice. All right, let's try hypothesis tests next. Hypothesis tests have two components, a null hypothesis that makes a statement about the population parameter of interest. I'm just going to use population parameter mu equal to four. And a hypothesis test has an alternative hypothesis that makes a similar statement about the same population parameter, though you get to choose how you relate the population parameter to that same value. Uh, your options are less than, greater than, or not equals to. I'll just stick with not equals to to keep this consistent from our course notes. And you choose a level of significance, which I'm going to declare as a variable, and I hope you'll see why by the end of this quick example. Now, we are doing a hypothesis test for a single mean which means we are going to be on the T sampling distribution. And the standard formula for a sampling, for a test statistic from a T sampling distribution will go like this. Start with your best guess of the population parameter of interest. Subtract off the value in the null hypothesis and divide that entire quantity by the standard error. Now I'm not gonna run that code yet because I don't want us to know whether t is positive or negative. The standard way to calculate a p-value from here is just to assert yourself into the right tail by taking the absolute value of your test statistic. Now remember, we're trying to calculate a p-value, which starts with the letter p, as does the function you will use to calculate it. We're going to use p t, since we're on the t sampling distribution. Don't forget your 
degrees of freedom. And I'm going to remind you that all the functions that start with P in R deal with area to the left. But relative to the picture we saw in my notes earlier, we want area to the right to pick up that right tail. And in fact, that's only half the area we want. So we're going to multiply this entire quantity by 2. And that will be our p-value. I'm going to show you the p-value. It's 0.14. Because I used my level of significance as a variable here, you can actually just ask R to tell you, is your p-value less than your level of significance? It is not. So our p-value is not low. So here we fail to reject HO. And I do want that double negative in there. You failed to reject. That is proper language. You never accept the null hypothesis. Never accept the null hypothesis. You only fail to reject it at best. The way you can uh, remember this is through a little catchy phrase. If p-value is low, reject HO. p-value is not low here. So we fail to reject HO. So that concludes our example for a single mean mu, both the confidence interval code, which is in total five lines of code, and code for a hypothesis test, which in total is four lines of code. But notice mu hat and the standard error show up in both the formula for a confidence interval and the formula for a test statistic. So really, it just depends on you using those same summary statistics, that is mu hat and sigma hat, and like manipulating the pieces in slightly different ways. So let's change our example from a single mean mu to a single proportion p. And I'm going to keep my variable x here, but I'm going to create zeros and ones by asking which of the x's are equal to 4. And then if we just look at the head of y, and remember that false in R, most computers in fact, is 0, and true is 1. So the first six observations we have consist of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> okay, so be it. And then I'm going to show you how to adapt the rest of this code to the slight change of variable y. So now we have y, which consists of zeros and ones. Nonetheless, we can still take the mean of y to get our estimate for the population parameter p. I'm not going to change mu hat to really emphasize how similar all of this code is. But we do need to change all our x's to y's. And it turns out those three lines of code are all you need to update to a proportion. The other thing you need is we are now on a normal distribution, which awkwardly enough uses the letter Z instead of T. So we'll change Z, uh, T to Z and QT to Q norm. Normal distributions don't have degrees of freedom, so we'll get rid of that. And we'll change Z to T. And indeed, here is a confidence interval appropriate for a proportion. Now, we can check with some fancy code that I'm not going to really explain to you all whether or not that confidence interval includes the true population proportion of interest. And we see that it does. This confidence interval is amongst the 95% of some 10,000 or more confidence intervals that do contain the true population proportion of interest. There are, though, some 5% of confidence intervals that do not contain this true population parameter. So I hope you agree that the updated code for a confidence interval for a proportion is really not much different than the code we saw for a confidence interval for a single mean. 
and similarly for hypothesis tests, only some few changes are necessary. We are going to make statements about the population parameter p. I'm going to pick 0.4 as the value to test against. We change the alternative hypothesis in a similar way. We can leave our level of significance. Mu hat and SE are already updated from before, so we just update the value from the null hypothesis and change T to Z. And indeed here we're going to use the normal distribution instead of the T distribution. And normal distributions don't have degrees of freedom, so we'll get rid of that. We don't know anymore if we're going to fail to reject, so we'll erase that and then rerun this code. Update the value z, update our p-value, and then ask, is our p-value less than our level of significance? It is not. So we fail to reject ho. And just reminding you that I insist upon that double negative language, which will be frustrating for only like maybe one more week. Then you'll get over it. So here it is one screen worth of code that captures all that we need for basically this point in the semester. We can do random number generation. We can do confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for both proportions and means with a minimal amount of code. Hopefully, after about a week more of this, you'll agree that plots actually tend to take more code than either hypothesis tests or confidence intervals.